All right. Welcome to the potentially 650 officials from across Canada uh, who have joined us tonight for our second webinar sponsored by the CBOC and hosted by the Alberta Basketball Officials Association. Before uh, we get into our main topic for the evening, I have a few housekeeping items that I wanna share with everybody. The first housekeeping item is a save the date announcement. We have uh, two upcoming webinars uh, over the next two months. Our next webinar will be on Wednesday, June 17th, and um, it will feature the topic of leadership in officiating with uh, a well-known official to probably a lot of people on this call, Michelle Roop, NCAA official, um, who specializes in uh, the concept of leadership. In July, we have another webinar on July 12th, which is a Sunday. Um, we're featuring uh, Dubrovka Martinovic. She is a sports psychologist from Croatia who works with FIBA. And um, she uh, will be speaking to us about um, the psychology of officiating. Some housekeeping items for this session. Uh, please remember to click on the chat function because uh, that is where you'll find some downloadable videos for this session. Uh, download the videos to the computer, your computer if you like. Some internet connections may be a little bit slow and, and the video may lag a bit uh, during the Zoom session. So feel free to download uh, and watch the videos uh, as the um, presentation proceeds. Second, um, if you have questions, please use the chat function. In the drop down, select uh, the user that says questions, type in your questions, and hit enter. At the end of the session, we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, <clears throat> so, getting to the agenda for this evening. Um, the topic uh, for the evening is distance and stationary. Distance and stationary is one of our IOTs, uh, individual officiating techniques, and those were introduced by FIBA as the most important foundation of either the two-person or three-person officiating. So basically, we're talking about the fundamentals of officiating fundamentals that you need to have in order to process and facilitate correct decisions on the floor. So we're starting tonight with distance and stationary. As you can see, there's 10 uh, IOTs. There's really um, <clears throat> nine through FIBA and the 10th is a Canadian modification. You can find, we've created this one pager um, and you can find this on game plan under the documents tab in the official section. So feel free to go on to game plan, uh, print this out so that you have a refresher and um, uh, we hope to have more um, webinars that highlight some of the other IOTs. Um, after uh, Reed and Jake present on the IOTs, we will have um, Mike Thompson, the new manager of officials development and Tim Hyde, the chair of the CBOC, join us to talk a bit about the CABO to CBOC transition and to answer any other questions that you may have. All right, um, so without further ado, let me introduce our guest speakers. Uh, we're fortunate to have Reed and Jake with us tonight because uh, in 2018, when we created this, these modules on individual fishing techniques, uh, Reed, Jake, and Jim Walsh um, were the creators of this module. Reed Scott, uh, Reed hails from Kelowna, BC. He's uh, been an official for 21 years. He's um, currently a member of the Kelowna Basketball Officials Association. 
and he has been a FIBA official since 2012. Reed is also a member of the Development and Education Subcommittee, and Reed has shared uh, with us two of his favorite memories. One was in 2017, where he officiated at the Under-19 Men's World Cup in Cairo, Egypt, and in 2018, when he officiated a window game, uh, Mexico versus the USA senior men's um, uh, window game in Mexico City. Jake Steinbrenner, Jake um, just abruptly, I guess, ended his 43 year officiating career. Um, COVID has had an impact on all of us and it certainly did on Jake's career. Uh, Jake has refereed CIS, uh, CIAU, so that means he started a long time ago in 1981, uh, and CIS basketball. He's officiated five CIS men's national final eights and one women's plus a number of CCAAs and summer nationals. Uh, the last four years, Jake has been a national, uh, has been a Canada West observer plus a national referee coach uh, since 2006. Um, and most recently, this March, uh, Jake was um, an RC at the 2020 Women's U Sports National Championships in Ottawa. Jake is currently the ABOA Director of Performance and Assessment. All right, guys, over to you. Sorry, I'm just unmuting them. Can you hear me, Maddie? Yeah, I can. And Jake will be one minute here. Jake, uh, it should be working here now. Test, test. All right, perfect. Go ahead, guys. All right. So thanks, Matt. Yeah, so as Nadine pointed out, um, there's 10 IOTs. So our hope and intent tonight is to introduce you to uh, the first of the 10, and that's on distance and stationary. And I really all want you to think about these as a tool for your tool belt. So if you think of those 10 IOTs as tools in your tool belt, we're, we're hopefully gonna cover off one of those tools that you can add to your tool belt today and take with you so you can go and practice and implement in your game. So that's our goal today and yeah, um, looking forward to uh, introducing this to you. So our learning outcomes today. So like I said, our goal intent today is to support you as officials learning the following outcomes. And that's introduce you to the key concepts of distance and stationary. Understand the impact of maintaining a proper distance from the play and being stationary when you make that call or not make that call, depending on if you need to blow your whistle or not. And the third point is understanding these concepts as, as complementary to the other IOTs as we uh, discussed earlier, and how to adopt them into your on-court skill set or adding to your tool set. Um, Jake, did you want to add something there? Yeah, just quickly, uh, thanks to CBOC for this opportunity to present to people all across Canada and uh, to all of you for joining us this evening. Um, to, to make sure that you get the most out of this, uh, individual officiating technique presentation. We encourage you to think about the reason for being in a learning environment. Why do we seek knowledge? So try to focus on the key words and phrases in the message today. That will help the learnings to sink in and allow for the development of a new skill. Without focus, upgraded awareness just won't happen. So we encourage you to make focus a key for the rest of the time we have together today. All right, so our introductory proposition. So using our open mindsets, I encourage you to think about these questions throughout the presentation as we unpack the concept and the fundamentals of really what distance and stationary are and how they're important to our game as an official. Uh, so the first point there is what does the optimal stationary position and distance to play look like? and kind of feel like as an official. And the second point is, what is the correlation between call accuracy and the readiness for the play and distance from the play? And thirdly, when are we our most accurate 
as officials and as play callers uh, during a game. So keep those in the back of your mind as we kind of go through the content in today's presentation. Okay, next slide. All right, so the first part of distance to stationary obviously is distance. Um, more specifically, what does distance mean in the context of basketball officials? So what does it really mean to us? So for those, for that purpose, we really define distance as how far or close to the, to the fish or to the play we are as officials when observing that play. This concept is important to understand as it will impact how well you see the play and thus your ability to make a decision correctly. Next slide there. So this is a visualization exercise. Normally we do this in person, but for the sake of the webinar tonight, uh, we're not going to spend a great deal of time doing this. But I thought it'd be a good idea just to kind of introduce it to you so you can at least take it home with you and try it on your own time. Um, so what I want you to picture is uh, what it might look like. So if you have from two different perspectives in the gym. So imagine you're Drake or you sit next to Drake on the court side. What does the game look like to you there? Versus if you got a 400 level ticket and you're at the back row. So what do those two different looks look and feel like and when you're trying to watch a game? So, uh, so when you get the chance, go home tonight or maybe later this week, try to just close your eyes and visualize what the, the game looks and feels like from those two different perspectives, okay? All right, so I think Matt, you're gonna show a clip here that's gonna kind of tie these themes together. Yeah, before this Matt, is a you, positive. Before, okay, if you got yeah, just a sec. So in this example, Matt's gonna narrate, um, but I want you to quickly note the, the positioning of the officials as the play develops, but more importantly, then listen to the key points that Matt makes. So go ahead, Matt. This is a positive example by the lead referee using the distance and stationary IOT. Lead is at the edge of play and is at a 45 degree angle on the baseline. This allows the lead to have a large field of vision and a big picture view to referee the most amount of players within their primary area of coverage. As the ball is entered into the post, the lead maintains its distance from the play and remains stationary to correctly no call this play at the basket. Maintaining the proper distance from the play is critical to maintain a wide angle to see the most players. The further we are from the play, the slower it looks, which helps improve our call accuracy. The closer we are to the play, the faster it looks and increases the likelihood of a reactionary or emotional call. The more we can be stationary to referee plays in our primary, the better. Being stationary reduces our eyes from bouncing, which increases concentration and focus, thus making it more likely to make a correct decision. This is a great example of the lead official being fundamentally sound and using the distance and stationary IOT to correctly no-call this play. Thanks, Matt. Can you uh, just queue it up at 30 seconds and, uh, and then just freeze it there? So I think we can all agree that the lead may experience the most pain here for an incorrect call. Um, but it also could open the door for problems in quality officiating for the entire crew if we, if we don't get this play right. Um, so reviewing the following points that emphasize when a referee has proper distance from the play. And in this case, the lead would be ideally between three and six meters from this play. Um, the, the points that Matt made, I'm just going to quickly review. The possibility of an emotional call or reaction decreases the further we get from the play. It also allows us to maintain a perspective because the movements look slower. And then in order to make, when we maintain a wide angle, it increases the possibility of seeing more players in our field of vision. We're gonna expand on that in a bit. And they can also see the big picture. In other words, there are next plays that will follow um, that they already have in their field of vision. And they can also be responsible for seeing the clocks or even seeing where their partners are. Thanks. So in this, this um, slide here, basically proper distance creates a wider angle and the referee is able to have more players in their field of vision at the same time. So for example, 
what can the the official who's positioned right on the end line there, what can they see in the first row? They can see only two players. And then the second row, it's three players, third row, four players, and so on. Um, in total, though, the official can see 26 players out of 36, so 72% of the court, okay, of the active players. Now, um, later in another IoT module presentation, you will, you will see the same visual, but with the official at a 45 degree angle, like was, was presented on the video. Um, and the, the referee positions themselves at the edge of play, as Matt described. But this increases the number of players in their field of vision to 32 of 36, or 89% of the, of, the, of the active players. What does this mean for game situations? So other than let, let's never allow 36 players on the court at the same time, um, basically, we, we need to understand how the game has changed over the last 56 to 60 years. There'll be a handout coming out later about spacing. Um, in the 60s, when the key was even smaller, the handout will show how um, up to 10 players were all jammed into the key. So in the area close to the basket versus in today's game, the key is so wide open because everybody is spaced um, around the, the uh, edge of play uh, that you can literally build an apartment, a small apartment in that space. So can you see the implications of how the distance IoT and its evolution has upon the officials positioning and spacing for today's game? Okay, so we'll have a quick, uh, quick poll for this next slide to start things off. You can see that, actually we need to probably let everybody have a look first. It's another example of, of three officials and their spacing. We'll give this 30 seconds. Okay, it looks like we've got 87% of our participants tonight who think that all three officials have proper distance, uh, distancing and 13% disagree. So if we could just clear that poll for a second, have a look at the actual uh, visual. Can we, can we remove the, uh, the poll? Is that better now, Jake, or no? No, well, I still see it. I don't know about everybody else. Okay, so on this play, the play is developed, obviously. So now we've got all the players uh, at the basket. So specifically, will optimal distancing allow the lead to shift from an edge of play view and big picture where they've got 89% of the court to a primary focus on two to four players? I believe the answer to that is yes. So what is the optimal distance? Is three to six meters optimal? I think that's probably where we're at. Um, the center official, on the other hand, just really quickly, um, is that an appropriate distance to see perhaps six to nine meters away and has six or seven players that they are responsible for, plus the, the flight of the ball. And then ultimately the trail has responsibility for all 10 players. And while his, his distancing position is optimal, his head position shows him focused on the ball instead of engaged contact by blue seven and the white rebounder. So uh, while other aspects are important, like the flight of the ball in the basket, the shot game clock, even the team bench area, 
The trail must position adjust in this situation to avoid weight 24 blocking a clear angle. However, for this, for this presentation, their distancing to me is all optimal. Secondary, the field of vision is also important. So does the lead center and trail also have views of players in their secondary field of vision? So right now you've got seven players, I think, at the basket and there's only three that are really disengaged. So it, it isn't that, that important. However, there's only one, and so there's only one action area at the rim in the restricted space. They have to visualize and practice these principles though, so that in games and under pressure, this becomes second nature. This allows their focus to be external. So in other words, they should be observing the action and not internal where they're possibly distracted by thoughts of where am I standing, where should I be, or even as sometimes creeps into our games, negative self-talk. All right. Next slide. Okay, so we're gonna play the video clip here. And I want again, everyone to take note of the official spacing. Um, uh so we're going to start here in the back court. There's a throw in in the back court. And as the official progresses up the court, he gets ahead of the ball, if you notice, which is something we trails are supposed to trail the play. So stop it right there. Stop when we stop the video and actually back it up, please. Because we kind of got ahead to the, uh, to the mess that he gets himself into. Okay. So as the official progresses up the court, the most important principle here is to recognize that he needs to keep uh, a distance to observe not only the primary matchup at the head of the key, but we do have very high screens being set in just about all games nowadays. So he has to stay back. But in this case, he's also onto the court. And as a result, he loses his secondary coverage of the matchup to his right and gets in the way of the pass. So he gets into trouble, you can run it now, and the ball actually hits him. Now, if the video audio was on, that is the correct call, even because we're part of the play and the ball goes out of bounds, so he, he correctly calls the right direction, but I'm sure he would have got a, uh, a call on that play. So today's game, you know, I think, again, what we've said is, is how the spacing is so far away from the key, a lot of perimeter spacing, and then it, it move, it's, it's basically dynamic from there. Um, we need to have optimal distancing uh, as one of our critical um, points of emphasis in IOTs. We can go to the next. Is that the, no, we, okay, so slide 11, I guess, or whatever it, number it was. Just go back one. So just to review, so the key to positioning of officials in the lead and trail in two person and lead, trail, and center in three person, distancing is, is, is a key. Judging optimal distance to the play is fundamental to establishing correct angles and open looks. We've heard that as well. In, in most of our games. Finding the correct distance to the play increases with practice and experience. Thanks, Jake. Can you hear me, Matt? You're good. Okay, yeah, so thanks, Jake. So the second part of uh, today's fundamentals is, is stationary. So we talked about distance and how far we really need to be from the play. So now the second part of this is stationary. So again, we're gonna define this in our context. So in our context as officials, as officials, stationary is staying in the same spot for a period of time and really observing the play from that stationary spot. And this is critical to understand because if we are moving as officials, we really put ourselves at a disadvantage and often <laughs> as we're really in a disadvantage to actually evaluate the play correctly. And often we're not even aware whether or not we're moving when we make that decision to blow the whistle or to not blow the whistle. Um, and, and quite often, if you get the chance to watch yourself on video and watch some of your games, uh, take note of that if you're, if you're making calls while you're in motion. 
and, and really put that in the back of your mind actually as we kind of approach some of these, uh, these fundamentals as well. Um, if you're moving, it's, it's gonna put you at a disadvantage. And specifically because when you're stationary as opposed to moving, uh, Mike and Matt touched on this earlier, it, your eyes aren't bouncing around, like they're steady, they're level, and you're able to actually see a lot, the play a lot better. You can actually concentrate a lot better because if your eyes are stable, you're able to find your primary defender and get all your focus where you need to be right away as opposed to bouncing around and then trying to find the play that you need to find. That helps you increase your focus as well. And if you do, and if those things are all occurring, uh, the chance of you getting the call correct dramatically increase if you're doing that. So that's the what. So the how is a little, is a little bit more complex. So how do we get to be stationary as officials on the floor? Well, we, we need to be able to really get to the appropriate setup positions first and be ready to accept the play as it's coming towards us because we've got to that position first. And, and sometimes this requires a little extra effort and we're gonna show a clip a little bit later to emphasize this, but sometimes this requires you to sprint, not just a jog, but a dead, get the jets, you got to sprint. And, and a really good example of this is both two person and three person mechanics. And when you go from trail and you got to get to lead down at the other end, you got to get to the end line. Sometimes the jog's not going to cut it. You got to sprint. So a little extra effort sometimes is really going to pay dividends in your ability to actually evaluate that play. Okay. And, and, and if you do that, you're also going to be aware of a possible next play beyond maybe your primary matchup. And, and you're going to be able to use that appropriate body positioning to anticipate that next play if it's presenting itself to you and allow you to position adjust if you need to do that as well. Okay. And, and the last part before you transition here, if you look at that, uh, that bottom four kind of uh, process map there, move, stop, observe, decide. The second box there, stop, quite often we miss that one. We move, we observe, and we decide. What we want to really get you to understand and start practicing on, our, on your courts is the ability to get to a stop. If you, can get to the, if you can get to a stationary position and stop and then find your primary defender that you're observing, you're going to be much better play callers down the road. So next slide there, I think we got the clip to really show this example. And I don't want anybody to focus on whether the call is correct or not. I really want you to watch the official in reference to where the players are in transition. Matt, are you able to replay that? Yeah, do you, do you want these alternate angles first? Oh, actually, let's let it play through here. Here we go. Not so concerned about that look. I'm wondering if you can back it up to that uh, second slow mo. Let's see if we can play it again without to see. Hopefully, it doesn't lag. There we go. So if you can pause it right there. So on this play specifically, um, th this isn't an ideal situation to be in as an official. Uh, so you have really kind of two, two opportunities here to actually improve your, improve your chances of being in the right position and make this call. Unfortunately, this official is just trying to do the best he can, uh, trying to make the determination of a legal contact, whether it occurs or not. Uh, and he happens to move happens to be moving, which is not ideal. So you have kind of two, two opportunities to, for yourself as an official here. Like I said earlier, at trail, once you recognize that it, the, the play is going the other way, you can hit the jets. You got to put that extra effort in and you sprint to the end line. And we're not talking the jog, we're talking that's when you got to sprint. So if you get a dead sprint and you can get to the, the correct lead position on the end line there, you have a much better chance of observing the defender on the play and whether or not they have legal guard in position or not. The other option you have to you, and this is something we're just starting to teach a little bit, is instead of getting to the end line, if you know you're going to get beat and you know you're not going to get to the end line and get stopped and be able to watch that play, you'll have another option to you. 
and that is actually stopping about where the block is there, you can stop about maybe kind of six, eight, nine feet above the end line and watch this play as well, almost connected to the sideline there. So if you stop, then you can at least watch the play as it goes to the basket, then make your decision and then adjust your positioning depending on whether you made it, whether you blew your whistle or not. Because you're moving with this play, it's really, it's really tough uh, to see if you get this, uh, get the opportunity to get this chance or get the call right on this play and really evaluate the contact correctly. Jake, did you want to uh, come in on this one? It's okay. It's not muted. No, that, that's all good. Good. Matt, did you want to add anything? No, you guys are good. Okay. I think next slide here. Jake, you're up. So we've got two two visuals here um, with two officials, and um, we're going to have a poll here. But I want you to take a look at the two the two slides. So the um, official on the left uh, happens to be a Canadian, by the way, Nate Saunders, and the official on the uh, on the right. So I want you to ask yourselves. We're going to have a poll, and uh, do the officials in these in these two slides appear relaxed or rigid, stationary or in motion? So we'll queue up the poll, which I see, and we'll give it again thirty seconds. So Jake, just, question. Yeah, specifically for the left the official, left and official. I'm trying yeah. to move the poll if that works. Oh, okay. All right. Is the poll on the right hand side for everybody? Yes. Okay. Jake, did you want uh, to go yeah, through the second think, poll for the other referee? Sure. I think actually, yeah, well, okay, I see what, what we're doing here, yeah. Yeah, so just, just as a cue here, stationary and relaxed were for number one on the left, and now for the right, everybody go ahead, and I'm going to launch it now. If you could just sort of shift it to to um, away from the uh, visual on the right. Yeah, just one sec here. We're going to try this again, everybody. Sorry, I'm getting used to these polls. Let's try to relaunch it here. Uh, it keeps popping up in the middle. Uh, here we go. Does that work? Okay, it's still coming in. We got another 10 seconds or so. Okay, so I was quite surprised that some people actually thought that um, in both frames, uh, people thought that the official was in motion. Um, and I'm not quite sure. Uh, the official on the left is uh, leaning on his, he's got his weight transferred to his front foot, which is a way for him to stay engaged with the play at the basket. But I do, do not believe in this case he is moving. So he's stationary, his eyes are steady. And he's, uh, he's in perfect position to see the play. Um, the official on the right um, is also stationary. Um, but I think if we were to, uh, you know, take a comparison, which of these officials appears more relaxed versus rigid? And I think we would agree that the official on the left looks more relaxed. Um, he's got his weight transferred. He's ready to go the other direction if he has to, whereas the official on the right, their knees are locked. 
So he would be perhaps having to make a quick pivot or, or unlock his knees be, in order to go the other direction or even to, to maybe cross step or whatever was necessary for him to position adjust. So he looks a little more rigid. Um, the official again on the left, um, his arms are relaxed and his hands are loose, not clenched, whereas the official on the right, I know, I think he's ready to put up a, a signal for a three-point shot, but I, I think, again, he doesn't look as relaxed as the official on the left. So if you can, if you can visualize this again and put it all back to what we want from this module in terms of state being stationary and having your eyes not bouncing around, I think the official on the left accomplishes this very, very well. Okay. Thanks, Jake. Uh, Maddie, are you gonna, yeah, there you go. So we have that other clip coming up that really emphasizes everything. Matt, can you replay that again? All right, so freeze it. All right, there. So as you see, as we're coming up the, uh, the floor as a uh, new trail here. Um, so all the concepts we've talked about, distance and stationary. I mean, this is under the distance kind of column. So yeah, we want to ask ourselves, does this official have the correct distance from this plane, this particular spot? And based on what we've kind of learned today, we, we would probably say no. We probably need to have a little bit more spacing from that. Uh, you may not be able to prevent yourself, or not prevent yourself, but get yourself into a stationary position moving out the floor, but at least you should be giving yourself the appropriate distance to evaluate contact going up. So it breaks away a little bit again here. We're good. And then we have con, and then we have keep going. Keep going, keep going, boom. So this is where the official makes the decision to blow the whistle, to blow the whistle. So A, based on what we've learned already, the official's in motion and is too close. So not ideal. And whether the call is right or wrong, I'm not gonna argue this at this point, it's more, let's understand that we do have other options available to us as, as skills that we can help it get into a better spot to make a judgment on this play. Um, so ideally, we're probably going to want to be back around the eye, the eye on the Istanbul right over there to, to evaluate this play if you can, and probably out on the sideline um, just to get a good angle on if there's any illegal contact. Jake, did you want to add anything? Well, all I would say is that I think, I think the, um, the official focuses too much on the player with the ball, and as a result, um, gets too close and doesn't see the, the trap coming, uh, the double team. And uh, if you actually can go back a couple of seconds where the official is actually on the S, if you can go run it back maybe from five seconds and then stop it at seven seconds, I think it is. Stop, keep going, one more, one more quick click right there. Notice how the official's off balance and has to shift over and is totally focused on the player with the ball actually. And so sees perhaps the emotion or the, or the fear in the eyes of the player with the ball, and then you know, basically reacts to what could be, we, don't, we, we can't see for sure, but could be incidental contact here and, and just jumps on the call. If, if the official would have stayed back, like Reed said on the S, uh, I think um, this play could have been no call, or the you know waited a, a, a little more time so yeah that's all i got yeah and as we said at the very beginning of the presentation it, it reduces your opportunity to get in, engaged in a play and create an emotional call and, and that, that's a really good example that kind of ties that all together so so finally as we kind of wrap this up um and normally in a clinic setting we'd get you to spend some time to sit down and write write out some of these uh reflection ideas uh, we don't really have time for that today, but if you do get the chance after your after the webinar today, maybe jot down some of these reflection things. So I want you to think about a, a call that you had maybe this past year 
or a recent call in a game or whatever you had. And I want you to think about something you'd like to start doing as it relates to distance and stationary, something that you think you can stop or take out of your game as it relates to distance and stationary, and something that maybe you, you do really well and you want to continue um, as it relates to distance and stationary. So if you get a chance, maybe write that down, put it in your notebook and go and take that to the floor with you next time you get a chance to really practice this. Jake, did you want to add anything else? Uh, no, good job on the reflection part. And, uh, and this is the takeaway we want uh, is for you to all go away. I know we got a long time perhaps before we ever rough again, but this is the first step is, is to study. And um, when we get a chance again, let's practice, maybe in preseason or rec, rec league games, whatever starts up. But it's paramount to understanding the principle of distance and stationary when the pressure of the game is on and the player movements become continuously dynamic as opposed to, we had three good videos, but we also had a lot of slides where the play is, is static, right? So uh, you're gonna have to practice this. Yeah, thanks, Jake, and, and thanks everyone for letting me come on and uh, and present this uh, this to you. It's a it's a pleasure. Thanks for coming out tonight, Reed and Jake. Thank you very much. Um, anybody, please feel free to submit questions to the questions tab. Uh, we'll just take a couple here in the interest of time, um, and we'll transition into Mike Thompson and uh, Tim Hyde here with the CBOC transition. Um, so, uh, Reed, uh, we'll have you answer the first one here. Um, the first question that we we had pop up here: How do you feel about making the call when the official is furthest away and has the best look or angle? How do I feel personally? Is that what the call's referring to, or yeah, in, as a general kind of uh, to to re to reframe it? Yeah, I think it would be is it acceptable to have the official furthest away from the play to make the call if they have an open angle? And I think the second part of that, and this is me, feel free to jump in on this, Matt, as well, because you have some really good context to this. Um, I, I think the second part of that question kind of answers the first part. Sometimes the closest official does not have the best angle on the play. Sometimes the farthest official has the best angle on the play. I mean, we can think of it in a three-person mechanic, Sometimes the trail has the best look at contact up at the rim nearest to where the lead is, just because the sheer angle of where the lead is positioned relative to where the contact and the defenders are. So um, location-wise, yes, we'd, we'd prefer it to come from the lead, but sometimes the best angle to judge that contact is the furthest uh, official away. So in this case, it could be the trail. Matt, did you want to jump on that? No, that, that's perfect, Reed. And then, uh, Jake, we're going to go to you here. There, there's some really good questions um, that we're going to try to get to here. But again, with uh, time and keeping this to an hour, we'll uh, streamline it. And if we can't get you an answer tonight, we will. Um, I'll save the chat this time. But, uh, Jake, the question for you. Um, so, both of you presented and mentioned being stationary as an important uh, IoT. But what about positioning or angles? Well, okay, so th there's a lot of modules to come um, as was you know, laid out at the beginning of this. There are 10 modules. And so angles and, and seeing the gap or the open space is, is another module. But uh, without getting to the spot and being stationary, it's a lot more difficult to A, pick up the defense or B, to see that gap um and make make a, a quality call so you know with these pieces all fall in place and and work together in order for uh each individual official to make good call quality calls and for the crew to have success so you know i i hope i wasn't too vague on that answer but i i, I think that's you know it all falls into place when when you review all of the individual techniques together Jake, do you mind if I jump in? Sure. So uh, remember that slide where we have uh, move, stop as the second box there? Um, 
I really like think we have to really value that second boss, that stop part. Because if we can get to a stationary position and stop first, then we can look at where our not eyes need to be, where our defender may be. So wherever our focus needs to be, and then we can position adjust and adjust our position to get a better angle, which will lead into some of the other IOTs. But the first step in that is we got to get to a stationary spot and then be able to adjust based on what we want. Perfect. Uh, Reed and Jake, thank you. Uh, there's a couple of other questions, but in the interest of time here, um, we need to move on to the CBOC transition. Uh, we will follow up with the questions that are in the chat. I'll make sure I save it before we stop the recording uh, tonight. But with that said, uh, Mike Thompson, um, Tim Hyde, uh, if you guys could both unmute yourselves, you should be able to. I'm going to stop sharing the screen as well, if I can get there. And the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. And uh, thank you very much to Reed and Jake for presenting tonight, uh, Nadine for the introductions in the beginning, and, and Matt and the Alberta officials for all your work supporting this. I'm going to quickly turn this over to Tim Hyde, who's going to uh, speak a little bit about our new model CBOC. I'm not going to do a long introduction of Tim. I'll do a little bit more of an introduction of Tim after he's done. Um, I do want to be very cautious, uh, conscious of everybody's time and commitment tonight. Um, we have people in various time zones, and I've noticed we have two people that are actually well into tomorrow. I noticed our friends, um, Adamir Zurapovic, who's in Bosnia, Herzegovina, is on the call, and Alexander Glisic, who's in Serbia, are on the call tonight as well. So welcome to those very fine gentlemen uh, to this call. I, I see Nadine is smiling and you must have realized they were on as well. So if I can, I'd like to introduce the new chair of CBOC, the Canadian Basketball Officials Commission, and turn it over to Mr. Tim Hyde for an introduction as to what CBOC is and the transition we're going through here in Canada. Tim? Uh, excellent, excellent presentation. Uh, and thank you to every one of you for joining us this evening. Uh, I'd like to begin by publicly uh, recognizing and thanking uh, every individual over the past 46 years that has uh, held a position on the CABO Executive or National Council, and all of those also who have or are currently involved with any provincial executive or association's leadership. I can't overstate the importance of these people's contribution to officiating in Canada over the years. Uh, with the transition complete, uh, that being CABO to CBOC, uh, this is an extremely exciting time for basketball officiating community in Canada. There are a lot of moving parts right now and many pieces of play. Uh, we are now part of the Canada basketball brand. Um, this is already reflected by way of some resources that have recently been put in place. Uh, being part of the brand will provide access to resources that were not available to officiating in the past and will also provide an ability to partner with Canada basketball in exploring and securing new and additional resources. So a quick overview of the CBOC structure uh, it is defined in a governance document that was cooperatively authored and confirmed by the last cable executive and by Canada Basketball's board of directors. The new CBOC consists of seven commissioners uh, making up an executive council. Uh, four of those commissioners have been appointed and all of those are officials. Uh, these include Martha Bradbury, Secretary Treasurer, John McFarland, Education Officer, Rob Ferguson, Member at Large, and myself as Chair. The remaining three commissioners will be appointees from each of Canada Basketball, CCAA, and U Sports, uh, respectively. Canada Basketball's Domestic Development Department, managed by Ron Young, has dedicated two full-time staff positions to officials development. Mike Thompson, who you just heard from, the manager of official development, and Enrique Olasina, coordinator of officials development. The 
the CEOC Executive Committee, uh, or Executive Council rather, will uh, be meeting bi-weekly for the first while in order to set priorities and to, to get caught up on a substantial list of items requiring address and attention. Uh, the minutes of these meetings will be posted to game plan. I believe this is where the intention is to post. Uh, a few of these priorities, managing the risks involved in officiating games by connecting all the dots. So registered, certified, insured officials that are assigned by a recognized assigner to games that are a level of competition that the officials are qualified for and that have been approved or sanctioned by Canada Basketball or a PTSO. Secondly, rolling out the official development pathway, which will allow every official to understand the connection between level of competition and qualifications required to officiate the respect level. This will also allow every official to understand the realistic opportunities that are potentially available and what it will take to get them. Creating consistency in educating officials and evaluating their performance. These are just three of a very long list, but I can tell you that the Executive Council, the Officials Development Staff, and all of Canada Basketball are committed to checking these off that list as efficiently and effectively as possible. You, meaning all registered officials in Canada, will be represented. Existing provincial officiating organizations will continue to manage officiating in your province until they and your provincial and territorial sport organization have transitioned have transition to a provincial officials commission. In either case, a representative will be identified as the respective province delegate to the CBOC meeting. And the CBOC will be communicating regularly and working with both your provincial officials association and PTSO as they work towards establishing the provincial officials commission. There are many items currently being worked on and in various stages of progress. Two committees were approved at the first executive council meeting, while several others will likely be not very far behind. That being said, we are going to need many of you to participate in these committees and help to design the future landscape of vision in this country. Watch for postings soliciting committee membership applications. Take a look at the terms of reference and rationale that will be posted along with that for the noted committee. And if you feel that you have a skill set, experience, or specific interest that would benefit the committee, we want and need your help. We know there will be many questions that you or other people have for us. Please be patient with us as we look to create a space and a format questions to be asked and answers to be shared. At this point, I think we have maybe five or six minutes left in which I'm going to let Mike uh, add some comments and then he and I will take some questions. Mike? Great. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, I know a few people did text me that uh, it was hard to hear Tim at various moments. Uh, apologize for that. Uh, these webinars are very much a learning experience for all of us. We're uh, this being our second one. And as Nadine mentioned, we have two others coming, Michelle Roop on June 17th and uh, Dubrovka uh, Martinovic on July 12th. I will announce now and we will get you information shortly. We are going to add one on Monday night, June 29th. Uh, we have Jack Armstrong. We'll do a presentation titled Roles, uh, Rules Without Relationships Leads to Rebellion. So that will be on Monday night, June 29th, and we will get that out to you at some point. Um, I'd like to thank Tim for providing some information on CBOC today. Remind everybody that we're very much in early days as we try and adjust to this new model, but there's lots happening, and we're going to do our best to try and flip the pyramid. So rather than looking after the top dozen officials in the country, we flip the pyramid and make it about the bulk of the officials, the 95% of the officials in this country that are at level three uh, and below. And that's the overall goal is to flip that pyramid. I'll stop there and, and Matt, I'll just turn it back to you just to see if uh, anybody has any questions 
uh, on the model, anything that CBOC is doing. And uh, we'll try and be respectful of everybody's time and wrap up in the next five minutes. Yeah, so everybody go ahead and uh, send questions here. Um, first question here, uh, Mike and Tim. And Tim, if you could, uh, there was some mic issues, so maybe just a little bit closer to the computer. But uh, how do local boards fit into the new model and who is going to manage local finances? So it's, it's, it's a good question. Um, local boards are probably the most critical part of officiating across the country. Uh, local boards are acknowledged as the service provider who actually make officials available. Um, the, the local finances, there's no plan to make any changes regarding that at the moment. It is something we will look at long-term, but it is something that would only be done um, with cooperation and desire of the local boards who are having challenges managing those local finances. There's no, there's no plans at work um, to make direct changes at, at all. Um, there has been some conversations as to areas as to where we can add some rigor in terms of financial management, uh, sort of checks and balances that uh, are, are worthy of the type of dollars we're talking about. But there's, but there's nothing, there's nothing that is in the works or planned at the moment. I would simply add that um, the necessity of, of local groups, local boards, local associations uh, will not change. Uh, the, the, the connection with the, the local organizers of competition, uh, whether that's through an assigner, through uh, other form of contact within the local group, uh, that, that will happen. Uh, we need uh, uh, allocators or assigners, um, you know, that are, are, are able to manage a group of officials and a group of, of uh, competition uh, uh, organizers requesting solutions. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question here um, asking if there's going to be additional costs associated with this new model and then the second piece, are we moving to the new CBOC logo? So I'll perhaps go, go backwards. Uh, not sure I understand the question, are we moving to the new CBOC logo? Um, absolutely, there is a plan to do as much branding as we can to identify the CBOC brand. So we will be using um, a new CBOC logo. I apologize if I'm not understanding that part of the question. Um, the first part of it was around additional costs. Um, there are no plans to raise the membership dues. We certainly have a challenge, and that challenge is to identify other sources of funding. We have a very comprehensive uh, funding document that we've built, and we have to put some effort into raising that. One of my desires is to get away from a model, uh, a model where effectively in this country, officials have paid themselves to referee. Re referees has always been the source of the funding to support other referees to uh, travel to tournaments, um, to be able to referee at those tournaments and cover those type of costs. We absolutely want to move away from that model and move to a, a, what I'm describing as a user pay model. Um, there are some efforts to do that. And there is a definite need to bring funding into the officiating side of the business. And we've identified a number of steps that we need to take to do that. And this is part of our challenge in the early days is to really work on that structure and organization to allow that to occur. There certainly will be some costs that will occur at various times as we roll out additional educational models. Um, you know, there is going to be some cost recovery that's associated with that, but a lot of that will be a choice by the officials themselves. So from an annual dues perspective, there is no plan whatsoever to change the annual dues from where we sit at present. All right. And thank you, Mike. Um, in the interest of time here, Mike and Nadine, would you like to uh, close the meeting for this evening? So we're sticking to the timeline. I think we should. Nadine, anything that you want to add as a closing? I just want to thank um, everybody for taking an hour out of their evening to, uh, to join us to um, pose some excellent questions. 
um, and uh, also to um, take the time to learn. Thank you to, to Jake and Reed uh, for um, doing a wonderful presentation. Um, and um, I'll let you thank the rest, Mike. Yes, so, and uh, certainly I'll go back to Jake and Reed and thank them for the presentation, Nadine for hosting tonight, uh, Matt and the Alberta officials for the use of the technology, and uh, Tim for providing us an introduction to CBOC. It is um, very um, heartwarming at uh, the peak that I saw, we had 351 uh, officials online tonight. Um, that's, a, that's a great sign. And uh, hopefully we've uh, continued to pique your interest and uh, we'll see most of you back uh, for webinars on June 17th, June 29th and July 12th. Uh, wish everybody all the best in staying healthy in this very difficult period of time for the world. And a little bit of hope that uh, our days will start to get better and hopefully we'll be able to see you inside a basketball court and on the court in the near future. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much, Maddie. We can certainly close off. Be good all. <laughs>